Welcome to the Threefold Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is the podcast where you'll not only learn how you can achieve massive success in multifamily real estate investing, but also how you can simultaneously pursue great relationships with your family and a better walk with God. You can achieve financial freedom through real estate investing without sacrificing the relationships that mean the most to you. Now, here's your host, Lee Yoder. Welcome back, Three Full Listeners. I don't have a great guest for you this week, but we've got a great co-host. My beautiful wife, Hannah, is joining me again today. She was on uh, a couple months ago to grill me on our latest purchase, uh, what we call North Dayton, a 64-unit apartment complex in Northwest Dayton. And uh, today, she's going to grill me on our very first apartment syndication that we purchased two and a half years ago and have now gone full cycle. We just finished up the sale of that property So she wants to dig in and know all about why we bought that property, how we did on it, why we sold it, and um, how us and our investors did on the sale. So (laughs) Hannah, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, no problem. Happy to be back. All right. Well, let's jump into it. What do you got for me? Where do you want to start? Uh, I figured we'd start with prior to you purchasing Dayton 45. Mm -hmm. And I remember that time because we had a, uh, an eight unit, a 16 unit and a uh, 10 unit. Mm -hmm. And you came to me and said that you wanted to quit your job as a physical therapist and uh, go all in on real estate. And most people know I was pretty shocked by that. (laughs) And not thrilled, um, but I knew it was going to happen because when you put your mind to something, generally it happens. Yeah. Um, uh, needless to say, you did quit your job. You retired, as we That's like right. to say, from being a PT. You were kind of on the hunt for a partner. Um, and yeah. you found Kevin. Kevin found you, however it, the story goes, and um, which I was very comforted by that you weren't in it completely by yourself. Sure. Oh yeah. Uh, But having Kevin there and um, you guys just hit the ground running. Um, But I do remember it took you guys about six months before you guys even found something that something being Dayton 45. Yep. So why don't you start us back there as to what were you guys doing during that six months um, before, you know, you actually found it, but you were hopeful and yeah, where were you in that? Yeah, man, it's crazy to think all the way back to that. Um, you know, it was three years ago, um, three years ago today. Yeah, we we didn't even know about Dayton 45. Uh, we Yeah, we just had those three smaller multifamilies that you talked about. We just did little joint ventures with those. Um, I've talked about those in the past, uh, but we were getting ready to sell those. So when Kevin and I joined up um, about three years ago, actually o- over three years ago, and he became, you know, our, our first partner, Um we were on our way to owning nothing because we were planning on selling all those small multifamilies uh, that you mentioned that 30, 34 unit portfolio between three properties. I was going to sell those and that's how I was going to go full time. So when he came on, it was like, Hey, I'm on my way to zero units. Do you want to help me build this back up? But let's go after bigger properties and bring in more investors. So we really spent those six months. Like you said, it was, uh, it was frustrating at times um, as the months start to drag on, you start to feel like, are we just doing this for fun and, or is it going to actually work? And, are we going to eventually get something? But during that time, we were, um, you know, trying to find deals, but then also find money to be able to take down those deals. So I was really working on developing relationships with brokers in the area because, for the most part, the brokers really control uh, the multifamily space, especially when you get into even mid-sized multifamily and then definitely the bigger multifamily. Not many people sell those on their own, uh, like you might see in a house. I mean, but even houses, most of the time, it's a realtor, right? So. Uh, you know, when you go to buy a bigger property that, you know, with more zeros and, um, you know, needing to raise more money and all that and to qualify for a loan, the brokers are going to be skeptical if you've never done it before. So you really have to uh, establish a relationship there and, and establish an assurity in their mind that you actually can do this. You actually can pull it off. So you got to, you know, show them some things that you've got some things um, in line and that you're able to get this. And then, you know, Same thing with the bank, get, you know, get the bank on board with uh, funding a property for you. Um, And then behind all that, the investors have to come in and fund it for you. So I had already been, I was part of the RIA here in Cincinnati, the Real Estate Investment Association, been a part of that for a long time, had a lot of relationships there, a lot of people that wanted to get into real estate and then just family and friends. I mean, specifically some of the people that partnered with us on the small multifamilies that we're getting ready to sell. They were the ones that were ready to jump in again with us. We did so well on those. Uh, They said, yeah, let's, you gave us all our money back. 
plus, you know, a bunch of profit, let's put it back in on the bigger one. So that's what Kevin and I were doing was just trying to prepare ourselves when we did, did finally find one. Um, the brokers would take us seriously. The, the lenders would, would be ready to come in on it with us and lend to us. And then we'd have some investors ready to jump in on it with us. Can you talk about some of the specifics that you did during that time for people who are just very new to this and they're looking towards a syndication and you say, okay, building relationships, what is, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean yeah. just phone calls? Does that mean wine and dining coffees? What, like what, do, what yeah. exactly does that mean? Yeah. I, I think phone calls, um, going out and looking at properties, uh, you know, if, if a brokerage has a property listed, even if it doesn't fit your criteria, you know, you should go look at that property with them and then just tell them why it doesn't fit your criteria and what you're looking for. So then maybe they send one too, but yeah, take them to lunch. I was always taking them to lunch, to breakfast, trying to get to know them. And, and during that time, I'm explaining to them that we did have a track record. So right. yes, I had never bought a 45 unit before. This was our first, you know, purchase that big, but I did own 34 units. Uh, we owned a 16 and an eight and a 10. I, that's why I'm a big proponent of kind of building slowly. I think either you go that route or you partner with somebody that has that track record. So they can go talk to broker and go, well, we already own a couple hundred units. And by the way, Lee's working with me or whatever. But I, I chose to, you know, go to a broker and say, Hey, I want to buy this eight unit. I've already done a duplex. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's even bigger. And then, hey, we own 34 units. Now we're trying to buy this 45 unit. So um, you just want to present to them that you're that you're ready. Um, and then I, I mean, this is a whole different uh show, but you've got to be underwriting property. So you've got to be um, you've got to have some kind of spreadsheet uh that you use that allows you to underwrite a property, which basically just means um plug in all the seller's financials plug in all your projected, you know, financials for the next few years, and then determine what you can pay for the property, which will make it a profitable investment. And so I was just doing a ton of that. And then, yeah, same thing with investors. Um, yeah, a lot of times it's phone calls just because people are busy and maybe they don't feel like they need to come meet you for lunch. If you don't live close to them, they're just good with a phone call. But a lot of times, it's, you know, it's an hour long phone call, me explaining my um, experience so far. Hey, here's what we've done and, and the success we've had, the challenges we've had. Here's what we're looking to do you know, what are your questions and, and just get them comfortable and ready to invest with us when we do have a deal. Great. Great advice. Okay. And then you found Dayton 45. Yeah. Uh, finally found one. A 45 unit in West Dayton, Ohio. Uh, tell us how you found it. Yeah. Um, and, and two, it was two eight units and a 29 unit. So a little bit unique. And, and another reason it was kind of like a good step because we already owned 118 and then a 60. So this was just like two eights and, and a, you know, and a 29. So, um, yeah, on the west side, it, it was through a relationship, uh, totally an, a, a, a total off market property uh, through a guy who I had met through, I think, Bigger Pockets. I think that's where I, I first met Todd and we started um, talking and again, got lunch with him. I just, I'm pretty much always up for meeting with anybody. Um, I'll always go to coffee because you just never know how it's going to work out. I mean, I did not meet with Todd because I thought he was going to bring us a property. It was because Todd was doing what I wanted to do. And, uh, ends up that Todd likes properties that are rougher than what I'll go for. So Dayton 45 was a good opportunity, but Todd likes properties that are even rougher that have even more upside. So maybe more risk, more reward than what this property offered. So he, you know, kicked it my way and, uh, and he's a broker too. So he, you know, he was able to get commission on it. So he was like, you know, on that project, he's like, I'd rather just get commission on this one and kick it to another investor. And uh, he called me because we had, you know, developed a relationship and he liked me and wanted to see me get a deal. And also he thought, I could close it. You know, I told him what I had done and, you know, he saw my, my track record, but my hunger to do more. And so he thought, yeah, I'll, I'll kick it over to Lee because he's actually going to close this and I'll get a commission. What would you say is, was unique about these buildings in particular that kind of drew you to him besides the fact that it was just the first one and you're like, I got to do it. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, it, that was a little bit of it. Um, I mean, sometimes like the numbers just have to work. So yeah. uh, the price you know, we were able to get it out with, with the, you know, seller. We, we got them to come down a little bit more, but even where uh, she was at originally was like, okay, the numbers work at that, you know, with where rents are, it was like, um, this is, this is a good deal. So the numbers, um, the numbers always have to make sense. And they did, but yeah, what was unique about this one? I, I think we just saw the previous owner had done so much work. Uh, she had done like all the CapEx, she and he, two partners, but they had done the roofs, you know, the windows, um, got rid of one of the boilers and went electric heat and, and so many of the big things. And then they'd done like 75% of the unit turns, but they weren't capturing 
I think the fruits of their labor because they weren't running it professionally. Mm -hmm. So not that we had a ton of experience, we had just owned three so far, but we were working with a professional property management company that did have a lot of experience. And we felt like we had a really good working relationship with them. And so we felt like if we brought them in, we could just run it much better, much more professional and continue in the progress that they had made. So it was like, maybe they completed the first three phases and we were just going to complete the fourth phase of the full repositioning of the property. So we felt like we could take advantage of that opportunity. Okay. So you convinced the sellers to sell to you. Mm -hmm. Now this is your first indication. How did you get anyone to invest with you? And how did the capital raise go? And how did you finance? Yeah, great questions. It was, um, it was scary. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I'll start with the financing because uh, that was definitely um, tough, scary. I, I knew, I guess I did work with a mortgage broker on that one now thinking back about it because uh, when I first, when we got our first multifamily, the 16 unit, I mean, we had done a duplex, but when we got the 16 unit, um, I just tried to find financing. I went to like five or six local banks and none of them would finance it for us. It was really tough. So the very next one, I actually uh, kind of randomly got in touch with, um, got connected through that realtor with a mortgage broker. And that was amazing because he just brought me two loans and said, which one do you want? And it was so easy and he gave me a great loan. So, and so I worked with that same mortgage broker and um, they, they brought us a great lender here in Cincinnati, GE Credit Union. And uh, you know, they, they want to do local deals that that look like good deals. So yes, they they do care about the borrower, but they also care about hey, we want to we want to do these multifamily deals in our area. Like they will not, I don't they don't care how good the deal is. They won't do a deal in Indianapolis. They want to operate in Cincinnati and Dayton, um, and they will partner with people that they you know develop some trust in. But uh, so we did have some track records. We had to explain that to them. But um, yeah, I think they just wanted to do the deal and thought it looked like a good deal, and then yeah, trusted us enough to to take a chance on us with our first indication. Um, I guess the, the um, investors, you know, we had much more of a relationship with them. So we had been preparing them again, a few of them, it only took seven investors to take this one down, but three or four of them had already invested with us on the smaller stuff. So they had had experience with us and had a very good outcome and gotten, you know, their money back off of those because we had sold those. And so they were ready to go um, for that reason. Then the other ones that just been had seen what we were doing. So uh, that's important. People will talk about that. They'll say, you know, and I would agree, you've got to be telling people about what you're doing. So since I was doing that, and again, some of the investors came from the local RIA group, some came from church, but they had just heard me talk about what we were doing. So, and you know, by this time we'd been doing it for a couple of years. So again, while we had never done a syndication, we had never done a 45 unit, we had been in real estate for a few years and we had some success and we were just taking slow steps and people see that success and see how hard you're working and they hear about it and they see your passion. Um, and then we sold the deal to them. You know, they, they've, that's the other thing, you know, we put it all together, put a big investor presentation together and they looked at it and said, okay, we, we think you guys are going to, you know, you guys have gotten this figured out enough and you're going to do a good job, but also we think this is a good opportunity with this property. Okay. How about the inspection? Yeah. Inspection went, um, you know, went pretty well. Like I said, uh, the, sellers had done a lot of good work. I mean, really good work. And these were brick buildings. So the roofs were new, the windows were new, and you got a brick building. So there's not too many things, uh, big things. Uh, we did, you know, worry about the sewer, sewer yeah, the sewer lines and the 29 unit, got those scoped. That was a little um, scary, but everything checked out there. Yeah, I don't think there was anything um, surprising. Uh, we were happy with the buildings, happy with the units. Um, and really we're, um, in general, it didn't sway our business plan much at all. Okay. Speaking of your business plan, what was your vision and your business plan going into this property? The business plan was just take care of a few of the last remaining CapEx items so that this could really, when we went to sell it, it could really be a turnkey property. Um, there were a few units left to turn. So, uh, naturally units that haven't been renovated, those residents are paying really low rent. So we were going to take care of the remaining units, um, renovate them and get higher rent. And then all of the rent uh, was a little bit low. We thought we could do more. And then we, and, and even that was going to be a small bump, but what we really thought we could, uh, where we could increase revenue was increasing the utility bill back. Right. So uh, we actually took a little bit more of the utilities in, meaning we're now paying for the gas and paying for the electric and the two eight unit buildings, but we're billing them back a lot for their um, utilities, uh, like a utility reimbursement, they call it a rubs program. Um, 
And so we uh, that was a way we could increase revenue. And then again, just run it more professionally. It was run very mom and pop. They had a part-time lady just uh, using one of the units as an office. That was another kind of CapEx project. Immediately, we got rid of the office because we were using a third-party property manager. So actually, it's 45 units. But when we bought it, there were only 44 units that were rented. And we pretty much immediately added that 45th unit to be rented, which right there just increases your your, uh, revenue and then increases the value. I think it increased our value by... $60,000, $70,000, $60,000, something like that, just with that little, adding that unit, little studio. So yeah, that, that was it. Just, uh, you know, continue with what the previous owners had done, uh, do that kind of final leg of the repositioning and then just run it more professionally. And it sounds like you achieved your business plan. Yeah, I would say we we uh, we did. And, and much quicker than we anticipated. Um, and part of that was the market. I mean, the market helps when, when rents are going up, it helps you achieve your numbers quicker because, Mm -hmm. you know, rents are just going up. Uh, so we can force appreciation by, you know, renovating units and making the properties nicer and doing things like that. But then, you know, there's natural appreciation when the market just appreciates. And, um, so we had some of that just post the post COVID boom. Yeah. Overall, it it really did go well and we were able to execute our business plan. So there's always hiccups along the way, um, especially with this being your first syndication. What was probably one of the biggest hiccups for you during this ownership? Yeah, I, the biggest one is pretty easy to pick out. Um, we have a weird way of doing commercial taxes here in Ohio, and um, our taxes for this property were very low compared to the value of the property. There's a new law passed and stuff, so we'll see how it works out now. But at the time, school boards would get together and say, hey, you know, these properties are not paying enough in taxes and we get a bunch of those taxes. So we should go after them and make them pay more in taxes and we'll get more tax revenue. So they'll do that. They'll hire attorneys and they'll find properties like ours where we're paying much less than we should based on our value because our property, uh, what it's assessed at is much lower than what we paid for it. So the school board comes after us and says, we're going to go to the county auditor and get you reassessed much, much higher than what you are now. So your taxes are going to go up or you can just pay us off. So the better option for us was to pay them a settlement, you know, just right. pay a settlement, but it was still very expensive. I mean, approaching six figures. So um, that hurt uh, badly because uh, we just did not have enough reserves for that. I mean, I thought we had a lot of reserves because it, you know, like I've said, we had already replaced the boiler and the water heater and the previous owner did kind of everything else. So we were just sitting back, like, we just have a few unit turns to do. I mean, almost all the units returned. So we felt like man, that's enough. That's plenty. Like we're cash flowing like crazy. Everything's going great. And uh, that just hit us hard. Threefold. Uh, we loaned that property some money to get past that uh, point. So that we, we were happy to do that and that was fine. Um, but it's not, it's not the way we wanted to do it. And we did um, have to uh, suspend distributions for a little bit just to get our reserves built back up and get in a nice spot. I mean, the property just continued cash flowing, but we needed to put that cash flow back into reserves to get our reserves built back up. So that was really frustrating. You never want to suspend distributions. I mean, they made all that back and and, and then a lot more because we do, um, if we don't meet our preferred return on this one was 8%, then we'll make that up in the end. So we did make that up. And so it was all good, but, and it's frustrating just because the property again is, is cash flowing very well. So we're like, we should be paying this out to our investors like we did in year one because everything's going really well. But because, you know, we got hit with this $90,000 bill that we just never could have expected. Um, then, then we just, you know, we can't do that. So that was right. frustrating. Right. Okay. You didn't, I don't think you mentioned it yet, but you had projected to hold this property for five years. It's been two and a half. Mm -hmm. So can you explain that? Why the early sell? Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, we actually thought about selling it even after just like a, I think we were a year, year and a half in, and and it was just because the market, it was like, and so that was, uh, you know, at the beginning of 2022, like the market was just so crazy. We were like, we could sell it right now. We, yeah, it was, we had just owned it a year. It's like, we, we can sell right now for what we thought we we're going to sell it for in five years. It just, it was nuts. So you just, you have to consider it. So we did kind of um, throw it out there a little bit, but that's when interest rates started going up. So right. it quickly, the market changed very quickly as, as everybody can remember anybody that's been in the space uh, since then. So kind of brought it back in. Um, and then we got hit with that tax bill. So again, just a very frustrating year in 2022 um, rolling into 2023. Uh, I just started to look around again. It's it's still a good time to sell. It's not like it it's not like it was because interest rates are so much higher. But there's still a lot of money out there. There's still a lot of people want to get into multifamily. So we knew it was a good time to sell. And really, I thought it was worth taking a very serious look at it again for two reasons. One, um, we had really like we just talked about executed our business plan. So there really just wasn't much left for us to do. Now that's fine. I mean, it's 
kind of boring, but boring is good sometimes if you can just sit back and say, hey, let's shift into cruise control and just cash flow. Because yeah. we were back to that point. We had built back up our reserves and we were ready to like just cash flow going forward. So that's right. that's nice. That's great, right? Um, but there wasn't, because we had finished, like there just wasn't much more we could do to increase the value of the property. Like there weren't more units to renovate. There wasn't, we couldn't make the property look nicer uh, by doing some exterior renovations. They'd all been done. So you know, there was no real room for forced appreciation, which again is okay, but um, you got to consider that like this property, we're not going to be able to force this property to be worth more. That's what I'm saying by saying there's not much forced appreciation. Now, there's another kind of appreciation I mentioned earlier is natural appreciation. So there's some areas where, you know, you don't have to do anything to the property. And it's just in general in the United States, like we have inflation and, and asset values go up. And so housing increases. And especially in some areas, the values really go up. Well, this property is not in one of those areas. This property is in one of those areas where like, I mean, the values did go up a lot because of the COVID boom, but normally they don't. And so we did not expect to see much natural appreciation. So looking at, we thought, okay, here's what we think our property's worth today. You know, we were supposed to hold it another two and a half years. Will it be worth much more in two and a half years? Um, I, I thought, no. You know, it might be worth a little bit more, but the return we we would get for holding it those next two and a half years didn't um, didn't seem like enough. It seemed like we'd be better off taking our profit now and then investing in another project that will see more appreciation over the next two and a half years. So it's like, let's take this profit now um, over the next two and a half years, we wouldn't see much more. So let's take our profit and put in another one where we will see a lot more. So that was kind of our thought for our investors. Let's get out of this one, take our profit, get into another one that's going to see a lot more appreciation. Makes sense. I, I, I think there's probably a lot of people who are, or some people who are in, have this tension between, do you hold, do you sell? Do you hold, do you sell? Yeah. Um, just what is say that there's someone out there who has kind of executed their business plan earlier than anticipated. Um, and they're kind of in that, that battle. Like, do you, do you hold it or do you sell? Like, what would you recommend to someone that in this current market, I guess, who maybe is in that position? Yeah. yeah it's a great question. We, we've, we battled it. We, you know, I talked uh, a few episodes ago about selling the Alpine and right. that was kind of different because it wasn't an appreciating area. It wasn't a good area, but you know, different factors there. So it's definitely a tension. I would say, go back through the two things I just mentioned. So first, is there more forced appreciation? Can you do more with the property? Um, if no, cause like, Hey, no, we also execute our business plan. Okay. But is it in an appreciating area where, Hey, if you just hold it and just cash flow, that's great. But also the value is just going to keep going up man, I would really think about holding if it was in an area like that. And again, that's why it was so hard to sell the Alpine because it was an area like that. Right. But then the third thing I think is really important is, do you like managing it? Do you like owning it? If it's a property that's pretty easy to manage and you feel like whether you're managing yourself or third party, like it's just, it doesn't, it's not a drain on you. It's not a drain on your time or just your you know emotions. And it's like, no, we really don't worry about it. It's good. It's in a good area, good residence. That man, that would make me want to keep it. Um, and so if it's easy to manage, it's 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 not a, a drain on your time and your energy, and it's in an appreciating area, I would hold on to it. But if it's not an appreciating area, and if you don't like it, if you don't like managing it, hand it and you and you can make a good profit. And of course, I, I think that's a given in this. You wouldn't, I guess I wouldn't necessarily think about selling if you hadn't made a profit because hey, sure. then you're not done. Right. But if you can make a profit, then I would go ahead and let it go if you don't like managing it. Um, if it's just rough, then, then get rid of it. Go get a different one that you like better. Um, yeah. if you can, you know, do well on it and get out of it with a win. Um, but if you like it and it's in a good area, I would hang on to it. Okay. So once you decide to sell it, explain how you went about that. Yeah. Good question. Cause yeah, we, we kind of floated out there, uh, the year before and didn't, didn't happen. Uh, so we kind of just started doing that again. Fortunately, again, it goes back to relationships. This property is a perfect example of how important relationships are. Another guy who's actually more of a realtor, but he's an investor himself. He's got a partner um, and they kind of saw what I was doing. There's like, hey, we're trying to do that. Let's meet up sometime. So I had lunch with both of these guys, I think together and then separately. And so just developing a relationship and the one called and said, hey, I've got a 1031 buyer out of California. He's looking for something between 800,000 and a million dollars because he just sold uh, a rental property out in California. He already owns in Dayton. He wants to own more rental properties in Dayton. Do you have anything for him? Well, we were wanting to sell our kind of target price was, you know, two, seven, something like that for the entire 45 unit package. But I was willing to sell the two eight units by themselves because I thought they'd make a nice little package and the 29 could be by itself. So the two eights for close to a million. So right. I said, yeah, I've got something between 800,000 and a million. Now, of course, I started a million um, for those two eights and and he loved them. He, he 
um, you know, he actually had that, that, uh, realtor, that investor friend of mine go and underwrite it and then go look at him and everything. And, and so that buyer was like, this is perfect for my 1031 exchange, which is where, you know, when you sell something, you take all of the profit, you don't have to pay any taxes on it. Cause you take all that profit, um, and the money you had invested originally and put it in the next one, which was our two, eight units. So I think he sold a quad, a four unit out in California and then, and then bought 16 units in Dayton, uh, which I think is a good trade for him. Um, and then he liked, doing business with us. Um, and he really is, is he, he's a young guy. He wants to grow. He's hungry. He's got people that want to now invest with him. So it's almost like going back to where we were two and a half years ago. That's right where this guy is. Sure. And so he bought the two, eight units just with that 1031 exchange. But then he decided, Hey, I want to buy that 29 unit as well. I'm going to bring in investors and syndicate that. And that was his first syndication, which is kind of cool. Right. Um, and so that same buyer ended up buying the 29 units. We, we, Close them about two or three months apart because uh, it took a while, maybe two months apart. But he, that buyer out of California ended up buying both of them. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So what everyone's dying to know is the numbers and how, how did your investors do? Yeah. I'm happy to share the numbers. It's fun to share the numbers when they're, when they're good. Um, <laughs> we always say during, you know, some QBRs are really fun because the numbers are awesome. Some QBRs are, you know, a little bit tougher because the numbers aren't always awesome. But yeah. So just to recap, we purchased this property in February of 2021. Uh, for 2.1 million, um, just uh, about 46,000, 46 point, 46,600 uh, per unit. Uh, we got a loan uh, for 1.68 million. So it was an 80% LTV loan. Uh, we raised 550,000 from our investors, um, put about 80, a little over $80,000 into the property. We were, so we were all in for just over 2.2 million. Um, we sold uh, in May and then again in August, because again it was a split, kind of a split sale for just under 2.6 million. So we sold for five hundred thousand dollars more than we bought it for, um, which you know not quite twenty five percent more than we bought it for, but pretty close. So maybe I don't know math twenty three percent more than we bought it for in just two and a half years. So again, really happy with that because, like I said, this isn't really an appreciating market, and we didn't do that much to the property. So we were really happy with that outcome. Again, held for eighteen months. Um, yeah. Great numbers, really, really excited. Obviously, the investors are really happy with that. Okay, that is awesome. One last question. Your first big boy property just went full cycle. So yeah. what do you know now that you about apartment syndication that you did not know prior to owning Dayton 45? Yeah, that is a great question. I would say two things. Um, one, going back to the tax settlement. So that was the the biggest um challenge for us. And uh, it comes down to not having enough reserves. So I don't necessarily think we should have anticipated that we would have to pay a tax settlement like that because it was a really unique time. Again, I didn't get into it, but because this new law passed in that summer, these school boards knew they weren't maybe weren't going to be able to get away with this anymore. So they really came after people hard. And normally you would be able to pay out those taxes over three years right. and they made us do it in right in one fail swoop. So uh, not that we necessarily should have expected that, but you should expect the unexpected. And I've learned this lesson like three times now. So hopefully it's the last time, but let's hope so. Yeah. You have to raise more <laughs> reserves. So we've just, we've gotten, we raise more and more and more reserves. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in reserves. And um, just because who knows what's going to happen? Like maybe we get a tax settlement. Maybe it's something else. Maybe we have a fire. Maybe we have this. Maybe somebody sues us. So we just want to have more reserves. And if you do, then when the unexpected happens, it's okay because you, you know you have those extra reserves, that, that rainy day fund. Um, so that's one. And then two, I would just say, you're going to sell in the same market in which you bought. So I'll explain that a little bit, but we were really excited about this property. We bought it like an eight cap. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can buy it an eight cap, and then you start running some numbers and you increase the value. And then you're like, yeah, but the market in general, like, let's just take Dayton, Ohio, you know, at the time when we sold and, and before, like things are selling at like a six cap. So we can sell to six cap. Right. Well, part of the reason we bought it an eight cap was because yes, a lot of areas in Dayton sell to six cap and some stuff sells at a five cap in the really nice areas in Dayton, but not this area, not in the West side of Dayton. Right. Now we sold for better than a, a, a eight cap. I think we sold, you know, maybe it was, I think right about six and a half, but it wasn't at a six cap at a six cap. We wouldn't even done any better. And definitely wasn't in the five. So just know that like, sometimes if you're a, a newbie to multifamily investing, you want to get your first uh, multifamily property, or you want to do your first apartment syndication, you might see some properties where the numbers look great. 
and you're saying, oh my goodness, I can't believe I get to buy this at a eight cap and everybody else is buying at six caps, five caps, four caps, even whatever. We're going to do so well because we're going to sell to six cap. Well, you might if you bought in a six cap area, but be be careful because real estate is very local. That's what everybody says, right? Location, location, location. It's all local. So when we went to sell, we were selling in a rough area, just like we bought in. And that was part of the reason we got a good deal, but that's also the reason we had to give our next buyer a good deal because it was in it was in a rougher area. So if you buy in a really nice area and you have to buy at a four cap, well, hey, you get to sell at a four cap. Likely, again, there's bigger macro trends that, that are at play. And when interest rates go up, cap rates tend to go up, right? We've seen that, uh, that expansion on the cap rate. So that kind of stuff happens, but you can't change the market unless, you know, suddenly there's some gentrification and stuff like that. But we just learned we're going to sell in the same market we bought in. And so keep that in mind. Yeah. Makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. That was fun. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. It helps me talk through it with having you in here. You've been a big part of it. So, uh, yeah, it's fun to look back. It was, uh, we were in a totally different spot. I had a full-time job as a physical therapist before Dayton 45. That's right. And, um, we started selling those small multis that we talked about and jumped all in and got Dayton 45 and um, the rest is history. We've been able to We're still going. stay full time at it so far. We're still going. We'll see we're how far. Not back being a PT yet. So. We'll see three years from now where we're at. Right. Check back in. All right. Well, that's it for this episode. We'll see you on the next one. Okay. See you later. Thank you for joining us for another great episode. I hope you'll take action on what you've learned today. If you enjoyed today's show, please consider leaving Lee a five-star rating and review. And check him out on threefoldrei.com. Until next time, 1 Timothy 617.